So you've set out your goals for the country, 100 million vaccine doses by next week, $100 million out the door, every American eligible for the vaccine by adult American by May 1st, something close to normal on July 4th. But tell everyone, when is everything going to be normal for Americans? Well, first of all, I won't even be able to meet the July 4th deadline unless people listen, wear masks, wash their hands and socially distance because not everyone by July 4th will have been vaccinated. How do you get the politics out of this vaccine talk? I honest to God thought we had it out. I honest to God thought that once we guaranteed we had enough vaccine for everybody, things would start to calm down. Well, they have calmed down a great deal, but I just don't understand this sort of macho thing about I'm not going to get the vaccine. I have a right as an American, my freedom to not do it. Well, why don't you be a patriot? Protect other people. How about emphasizing the positive? How has life changed for you since you got the vaccine? I can hug my grandkids now. They, they come over to the house. I can see them. I'm able to be with them. Uh, I've had the vaccine. And uh, secondly, uh, it has changed my life in the sense that I've been able to demonstrate to other people that I doubt whether people would expect me to take it, but I think it was safe um, to make the case that it is safe to take the vaccine. It's important to take the vaccine. Let's talk about the crisis at the border. Some heartbreaking scenes down there yeah. right now. And a lot of the migrants coming in saying they're coming in because you promised to make things better. It seems to be getting worse by the day. Was it a mistake not to anticipate this surge? Well, first of all, there was a surge the last two years in, in, in 19 and 20, there was a surge as well. This uh, one might be worse. No, well, it could be, but here's the deal. First of all, the idea that Joe Biden said come, because I, I heard the other day that they're, they're coming because they know I'm a nice guy and I won't do they're what Trump did. This. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. They're not. The adults are being sent back, number one. Number two, what do you do with an unaccompanied child that comes to the border? Do you repeat what Trump did? Take them from their mothers, to move them away, hold them in cells, et cetera? We're not doing that. So what we're doing is we have brought in, brought in HHS and also brought in FEMA to provide for enough safe facilities for them to not to get out of the control of the border patrol, which are not designed to hold people for long periods of time, particularly children, get them out of those facilities. And most of them come with a phone number. So what we're doing is we're putting together an entire organizational structure so that within seven days, you're able to get in the phone, contact that number, find out whether there is a mother or a father, whether it is safe, whether it is a secure circumstance to get the child to that adult. It's going to take some time, though, to get those policies in place again. Do you have to say quite clearly, don't come? Yes, I can say quite clearly, don't come. And what we're in the process of getting set up, and it's not going to take a whole long time, is to be able to apply for asylum in place. So don't leave your town or city or community. We're going to make sure we have facilities in those cities and towns run by DHS and also access with HHS, the Health and Human Services, to say you can apply for asylum from where you are right now. Make your case. We'll have people there to determine whether or not you are able to meet the requirement you qualify for asylum. That's the best way to do this. In addition to that, while we also change the circumstances on the ground in those communities, you're going to diminish the reason why people want to leave in the first place. You're out here selling your COVID relief package. You're executing the COVID relief package now as well. What's next on your legislative agenda? If you notice the criticism of the COVID relief package from my Republican friends, is they say it spends too much money and it gives too many tax breaks. All these tax breaks go to the bottom 60% of the population. And guess what? They need it. The $1,400 check, child care tax credit. They don't like it because, in fact, their, their idea of a tax cut is to give the Trump tax cut where 83 percent went to the top 1 percent of the people in America. You're going to be raising those taxes. Yes. Anybody making more than $400,000 will see a small to a significant tax increase. If you make less than $400,000, you won't see one single penny in additional federal tax. But let's talk raw politics here. You didn't get a single Republican vote for tax cuts. 
How are you going to get a Republican vote for a tax increase? Oh, I may not get a, uh, but I'll get the Democratic votes for a tax increase. If we just took the tax rate back to what it was when Bush was president, top rate paid 39.8%, 6% in federal taxes, that would raise $230 billion. Yet we're, they're complaining because I'm providing a, a, a tax credit for child care, for the poor, for the middle class, keeping people. And by the way, my proposal in, in, in the relief plan I put forward, it creates 7 million jobs, according to a whole range of people, including uh, Moody's on Wall Street, number one, increases the GDP by over a trillion dollars, actually raises, raises income in America and diminishes debt in America. I mean, what but are these guys your, talking about? By your own about? admission, you just say you're not likely to get Republican votes for the tax increase. You're not likely to get Republican votes for H.R. 1, expanding voting rights, or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So aren't you going to have to choose? I know you've been reluctant to do away with the filibuster. Aren't you going to have to choose between preserving the filibuster and advancing your agenda? Yes. But here's the choice. I don't think you have to eliminate the filibuster. You have to do it what it used to be when I first got to the Senate and back in the old days when you used to be around there. And that is that a filibuster, you had to stand up and command the floor. And you had to keep talking alone. You couldn't call for, you know, a, they, no, no one could say, you know, quorum call. Once you stopped talking, you lost that, and someone could move in and say, I moved the question of. So you got to work for the filibuster. So you're for that reform. You're for bringing back the talking filibuster. I am. That's what it was supposed to be. Look, I think, don't hold me to the numbers, George, but I think between 1960 and 2000, there were like, I'm making this number up, I don't know. There were like, uh, you know, 50 filibusters. And now they're like 200 since then. Since that Just put a hold changed. on it, that's it. Yeah, I mean, you know, so the idea, it, it almost is getting to the point where there's, you know, democracy's having a hard time functioning. A hard time functioning. And so, look, I'm not saying this is going to be easy, George, but I do believe there's enough Republicans over time who are going to have, look, you, you, they haven't had that epiphany you said you were going to see in the campaign. No, no. Well, I've only been here six weeks, pal. Okay. Give me a break. <laughs> been here six weeks. I think the epiphany is going to come in 20, between now and 2022. This is one, there's 78% of the people say they support this program. 52% of Republicans. Let's assume it's off by 15%. You're going to go home and campaign. Republican voters want that $1,500 because they're in trouble. Republican voters want to be able to choose between being able to send their, go to work and send their kid to a, a daycare that they can afford. Republican voters want to be able to take care of a child care tax credit. I mean, these are, it's not like uh, every Republican voter is, is uh, you know, a billionaire. You know, they're, and by the way, and I'm not saying we'll cha I'll do it again, but I want those Republican voters in suburbia. Director of National Intelligence came out with a report today saying that Vladimir Putin authorized operations during the election to under denigrate you, support President Trump, undermine our elections, divide our society. What price must he pay? He will pay a price. I, we had a long talk, he and I. We've, I, I know him relatively well. And I, the conversation started off. I said, I know you and you know me. If I establish this occurred, then be prepared. You said you know he doesn't have a soul. I did say that to him, yes. And to and his response was, we understand one another. I wouldn't be a wise guy. I was alone with him in his office. That's how it came about. It was when President Bush had said, I've looked in his eyes and saw a soul. I said, look in your eyes, and I don't think you have a soul. And looked back at me and said, we understand each other. Look, most important thing dealing with foreign leaders, in my experience, and I've dealt with an awful lot of them over my career, is just know the other guy. So you know Vladimir Putin. You think he's a killer? Mm-hmm. I do. So what price must he pay? The price he's going to pay, well, you'll see shortly. I'm not going to... There's... By the way, we ought to be able that old, that trite expression, walk and chew gum at the same time. There are places where it's in our mutual interest to, to uh, work together. That's why I renewed the START agreement with him. That, that occurred while he's doing this. That, but that's overwhelming in the interest of humanity that we diminish the prospect of a nuclear exchange. President Trump uh, reached a deal with the Taliban to have all American troops leave by May 1st. Are they going to leave? 
I'm in the process of making that decision now as to when they'll leave. The fact is that um, that was not a very solidly negotiated deal that uh, the president, the former president, uh, worked out. And so we're in consultation with our allies as well as the government, and uh, uh, that decision's going to be, it's in process now. Likely to take longer? I, I don't think a lot longer. But May 1st is tough. Could happen, but it, it is tough because, look, one of the drawbacks, George, and this is going to be like Sanskrit to people listening here, but uh, um, it is um, the failure to have an orderly transition from the Trump presidency to my presidency, which usually takes place from election day to the time you're sworn in, has cost me time and consequences. For example, we didn't realize how bad things were in terms of lack of vaccines. We were not able to get access to this information. That's part of, that's one of the issues we're talking about now in terms of Afghanistan. Let me ask you about Governor Cuomo of New York. I know you said you want the investigation to continue. If the investigation confirms the claims of the women, should he resign? Yes, I think he'd probably end up being prosecuted too. But you, how about right now? You said you want the investigation to continue. You saw uh, Chuck Schumer, Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, majority of the congressional delegation don't think he can be an effective governor. Right now, can he serve well, effectively? Well, that's a judgment for them to make about their state where they can be effective. Here's my position. It's been my position since I wrote the Violence Against Women Act. A woman should be presumed to telling the truth and should not be scapegoated and become victimized by her coming forward, number one. But there should be an investigation to determine whether what she says is true. That's what's going on now. And I, you've been very clear. If the investigation say, confirms the claims, he's gone. That's what I think happens. And by the way, it may very well be that there could be a criminal prosecution that is attached to it. I just don't know, but let the investigate. And I'm not, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I started with the presumption. It takes a lot of courage for a woman to come forward. So the presumption is it should be taken seriously and it should be investigated. And that's what's underway now. You probably walked into the Oval Office as president with about as much experience, if not more experience than any other president who's ever served, more than three decades in the Senate eight years as vice president. So what is it about the job that surprised you that even you didn't know? What has surprised me is that I'm not as surprised as I thought I might be. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like sitting, you know, when I was vice president, the big, big difference is that famous expression of Harry Truman, the buck stops here. For eight years, I had a great relationship and still do with Barack. And I'd always be the last person in the room. And I'd say, you know, throw the pass or run the ball. And I'd give my opinion. I was the last guy and I get to leave. But he's all by himself to have to make that decision. That's the big difference. Is Vice President Harris the last person in the room? Most of the time, yes. As a practical matter, yeah, she is. One final question. Sure. Is Major out of the doghouse? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is yes. Major was a rescue pup. Major did not bite someone and penetrate the skin. And the dog's being trained now, our trainer at home in Delaware. He was going home. I didn't banish him to home. Jill was going to be away for four days. I was going to be away for two, so we took him home. But you turn a corner and there's two people who don't know at all and you know and, and they move and, and he, he moves to protect but he is a, he's a sweet dog 85 percent of the people there love him he just all he does is lick them and wag his tail and um, you'll see him tonight i'm going to see him tonight yeah <laughs> mr president thanks for your time thank you george i appreciate it